Hi folks, you are very, very welcome to this Northern Ireland Science Festival event with Wendy Mitchell, Anna Wharton and myself, Dan Carson. Um, it is a wonderful way to kick off your weekend, whatever you're doing. I can guarantee you that for the next hour, there's going to be lots and lots of information coming your way, lots of inspiration coming your way. And I kind of imagine from the mood we're all in a wee bit of banter as well so <laughs> I hope you've got a cup of coffee or a cup of tea in hand and or maybe even a wee glass of wine on a Saturday afternoon um, and you're ready to, to join us. Now we would really love it if you get involved in the chat so if you've got any questions for Wendy or Anna if you look at the bottom of your screen you'll see there's a little Q&A function um, if you could pop your questions in there, that will just really help me to multitask um, and be able to read them and we'll, we'll filter them in at the end of the session. Um, we'll be together today for about 55 minutes um, and we're going to run through um, a little bit of Wendy and Anna's journey together, but we'll mostly be talking about this fantastic book, What I Wish People Knew About Dementia, which is not out very long, but is already a bestseller which I am absolutely delighted to have been watching it creeping up the charts in the book sales, and it's doing really well already. Before we get started, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my two guests today. Um, they're good friends of mine, and I am sad that we're online because we've been planning to have a, a big piece of cake and a cup of tea and a catch up, but this will still be brilliant. So we'll begin with Wendy. Um, Wendy was diagnosed with young onset dementia on the 31st of July 2014 at the age of 58 years young and that part is really important as you'll find out. Post diagnosis she was shocked by the lack of awareness both in the community and the clinical world and she now spends literally all her time traveling around raising awareness running events speaking online for the last two years as well and encouraging others to speak out in order to reduce the stigma associated with dementia. She's now the proud author of not one, but two Sunday Times bestsellers um, and other exciting projects in, in the, the plans as well. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted that we've got Wendy Mitchell with us today. She's been an inspiration to me for an awfully long time and I'm delighted that she's now a pal as well. Our other guest today is Anna Wharton. Anna has been a print and broadcast journalist for more than 20 years, which you wouldn't think to look at her because she doesn't look <laughs> old enough to have been around for that long. She's written for newspapers, including The Times, The Telegraph and The Observer, and was formerly an executive editor at The Daily Mail. She's also ghostwritten six memoirs, including Wendy's two books, which we'll be talking about today. She has an MA in creative writing from the University of East Anglia and her debut novel, The Imposter, which is flipping brilliant and kept me very good company over Christmas last year, was published in 2021. Um, Anna and Wendy are now writing a third book together, which I'm going to ask them about in a little minute or two. So welcome the pair of you. I am going to start with you, um, Wendy. Where are you in the world today and what has what your morning been like? I'm in the, a beautiful sunny East Yorkshire today. Uh, and uh, I've spent my morning walking my socks off. Fantastic. M much to Anna's disgust because she was <laughs> trying to get in touch with me and I, I, I never had my phone. So I, I saw the sunrise, the beautiful sunrise, and I saw the, um, the morning unfold into a beautiful day. Fantastic. You're making us jealous because most of us are in grey and grisly Northern Ireland. Oh, no. this morning. Um, uh, Anna, where are you and what have you been up to today apart from trying to track Wendy down? Yeah, I've just been sending Wendy loads of emojis. <laughs> <laughs> on whatsapp asking her where she is because she's literally been walking for hours <laughs> um but yeah i'm i'm in kent um so we're at opposite ends of the uh, country really and it's really sunny here as well actually and yeah. you don't want to know what i've been doing today it's been decorating and it's stressing me out so this yeah. is a welcome <laughs> break for me excellent um a few people here listening will probably be wondering why on earth we have you with us today, Anna. So I was wondering, you have the fantastic term of being a ghostwriter. Um, 
And it's something I wasn't particularly aware of until I met you. Could you maybe give us a little bit of background on what your role, I know you're, you're mates with, with Wendy, but what is your professional role with Wendy? Um, yeah, so I, so Wendy and I met in October 2016. Ooh, um, and it was, yeah, and it was after... After I saw a video of her on Facebook that I think she'd done with the Alzheimer's Society, and um, she was describing what it's like to live with dementia, and I, I kind of scrolled by and thought, oh, that sounds really depressing. I don't want to watch that. And then I thought, no, I better watch it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a look. And what Wendy was talking about was really inspiring, and she just managed to capture um, something that was really helpful in terms of the her analogy about the two bookcases and one that's um, the emotional bookcase that is very sturdy and the other one which is like a flimsy bookcase which contains our kind of everyday memories and how they get jum jumbled up. So um, so I contacted her because I thought well if I found that really helpful then other people would and I'm always looking for projects and people to work with. Um, so I contacted her and persuaded her to meet with me which we did in King's Cross and um, she likes to remember me in my leopard, fake leopard yeah. coat. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, and then we just, uh, you know, that was the beginning of our story together, which has lasted a few years now. You know, it's, it's quite a while now. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, because I, I, I write books by myself and I've collaborated with other artists, but could you tell me a little bit about the process of writing a book together? What does, you know, does Wendy give you the ideas and then you go and write them up or is it a series of, of more kind of intuitive conversations? What, what does that process actually look like? I mean, it was quite different with this book to the first book because somebody I used to know is obviously a memoir of Wendy's life. So, you know, she was the expert in that and we kind of worked chronologically through her life. And, and somebody I used to know is also told in kind of two, uh, it's told in the first person present and then it's told in the second person part of uh, past tense. Yeah. So, um, so that was, that was different. And it, it was kind of, my job was to come up with a concept and how we were going to package that and, mm -hmm. um, and make it an interesting read. Um, so, but this book was a different um, proposal because it is part memoir, part polemic. Um, and there's other voices too. There's, um, I wanted to include Wendy's friends and her playmates as she calls them. Mm -hmm. So we had some really fun Zooms all together. Um, mm -hmm. And um, then there's lots of academic research as well. So I really loved doing that, believe it or not. And mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Wendy's that, that That was the revelation of writing this book because for the first book, every time I mentioned re research, Anna's emoji would come back with a straight mouth and oh god, <laughs> that again. Whereas this time, she soaked up the yeah the the, um, the research that we needed to complement the book. Mm. Yeah. So when we we did some brainstorming and we came up with these six um, kind of subject headings and then we yeah we, we literally had like the you know brainstorm on a pad and we went you know going through as much as we can and our conversations because you know we're friends and so we talk all the time so I know the kind of things that are going is going on for Wendy and and so yeah it just kind of emerged thematically um and and we and I would probably go off and read some academic papers and then um, send Wendy, digest them and send her some bullet points of yeah. um, things that were interesting or I felt that she really would agree with or really wouldn't agree with or just to probe in terms of have you had experience with this? What about your friends? And Wendy also would put some of these questions to her friends and then we'd all meet on Zoom and have a chat about it. And yeah, have a laugh. Yeah, we had a real laugh. Yeah. <laughs> And Wendy, I, I'm guessing that most of this had you hadn't intended to be doing it on Zoom. Um, the idea, you know, was probably to do more in-person stuff. Well, we the whole book was written during lockdown, I yeah. think, wasn't it? So the idea of meeting anybody just wasn't on the agenda. Yeah. And luckily 
my support group, Minds and Voices, we, during lockdown, we met every week instead of every month in person. Mm -hmm. So it became a, a topic each week. I, I'd, I'd set them homework and then I'd, we'd record the, the Zoom session and I'd transcribe it and then send Anna the results and all that sort of thing. So it was much harder work this time than last time. <laughs> It was, yeah. a good lock, it was a good lockdown project though because oh, I was, was, she, yeah. she wasn't yeah. able to travel and go to her usual talks so no it was it it it, it gave me a purpose mm -hmm. during lockdown so you know that compensated for all the things I was missing yeah and I think I mean one of the things that I find at the start of lockdown there was a lot of folks like yourself who find community through their groups mm. that they, they go to and they were very afraid that those wouldn't translate onto the zoom things but yeah. I actually mm. I kept jumping into these sessions that were really alive and really fun and very supportive that did work well my, many of my playmates in minds and voices had never used zoom before and so it took a lot of patience and um <laughs> and a lot of fun as well trying to get them online we had we had one lovely couple who couldn't quite get it every week and we were we just had so much fun seeing what happened this week yeah. And, but, but they enjoyed the challenge of doing it. You know, it, 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 it could have been quite distressing, but yeah. we just made it fun. Yeah. Mm. And it, in some ways as well, I find that there were people who maybe would have been nervous about going out of their house or have access oh. issues, and they were able yeah. to join sessions as well. Yeah. So there's, there's pluses and minuses. Oh, yeah, it's, it's the same with anything, isn't it? But the, the Zoom provided us with that social connection that we desperately need. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, some people found it more difficult than others with so many faces on the screen all at once. But just to be there, you know, they might not have said anything for the whole hour. But just to be there made them feel still a part of us. Uh, mm. it, it was it was lovely. Mm. Wendy, many of us know you really well and we follow your blogs and your exploits on Twitter, mm. but there will be a few folks who've not, not encountered you before. Lucky yeah. now, they're going Lucky. to get to know you now. Um, they must you be know so relieved. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it's been seven years since your diagnosis, um, and which seems crazy to me, like yeah. thinking back. I think it's about six years since I first heard you speaking. What yeah. has changed for you in, in that period of seven years? Well, so, so much has changed from a dementia point of view, yeah. but also from a, a life point of view as well. I mean... Who, you know, who, who would have thought of that day that I was diagnosed that I would have written two Sunday Times bestsellers now with mm. Anna? So I, 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 I cope by trying to see the, the positives mm. and not dwelling on all the negatives. I think in recently... Um, I don't feel thirsty anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that's joined the, I don't feel hunger. I, I haven't felt hunger for, I don't know, a couple of years or so. But there's always a way around it. You know, the, I tell myself, I give myself the incentive to eat by saying, well, I can't go for a walk if I don't eat. So that makes me eat because I love going for a walk. Yeah. And with with drinking, I I'm fine if I'm at home because I like to 
hold a hug in a mug, which I, okay. is what I call my cup of tea. So that makes me drink. Yeah. So there's there's ways round coping with the the negative stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the things I very much enjoyed about the new book that you're you're so practical and so honest about. Here has some, here's something that's changed for me and here are some practical things I can do to help me navigate this next step in the journey. And for you know people like myself who have had loved ones with dementia and work with folks who are living with dementia, the practicality is just brilliant. Yeah, that's, it's the practicalities that we're never told anywhere else. Yeah. You know, the medical world is very good at the workings of the brain and what bits we've got wonky and aren't quite working as well. But they know nothing about living with mm. dementia. So unless people speak out and are not ashamed to say what's wrong, what they find difficult, as many people are, then more people will realize there are ways around all these difficulties we have. We've yeah. got, there's a great website we've developed called Tipshare, um, run by Innovations and Dementia. And Tipshare is filled with thousands of these tiny tips of, from everybody. You know, because it's not just about me. I'm not the only person with dementia. That's yeah. why we wanted to include so many of my playmates in the second book. But, you know, we, we've all contributed to the website. So there's mm -hmm. so many. Oh, hello. That's Derek. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He must have a tip for us, Wendy, that he wants to share. Yeah. He's saying, shut that woman up. I've heard too much from her. <laughs> no, I think what we'll also, we'll get that website up onto the Science Festival Twitter feed oh, yeah. if people are interested in, in, mm. in even sharing their own tips as well. Yeah, right. Well, you, you can share your own tips on the website. There's a page that you can share with the rest of us any tips that you've yeah. developed or workarounds you've found. And of course, you're, you're very clear in the book that there's no one experience of dementia, that, that mm. everyone is going to have a, a unique experience. So not every tip is going to work for everyone. No. It's, it's looking through and seeing if there's something that appeals to you, you know, we don't all need tips on, on one thing, you know, so it's, it's finding something that works for you because my tip might not work, work for one person and it might for another. Um, I'm going to bring Anna back in because um, you had, you know, you published the first book to great critical acclaim and success. What make, made you go, do you know what, I think there's a second book in this and even I, I hear there's a third now in the pipeline. Yeah. Um, was it, you know, fame and success you were after or was there something else driving you behind yeah, that? Yeah, completely fame and success. Yeah. I thought that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was in the first lockdown, actually, um, because, you know, a lot of the ways that Wendy's found a coping is going back to basics. I think we all had to go back to basics and lots of people were talking about hearing birds and singing and going out for a walk. We had that lovely weather at the beginning of that mm -hmm. lockdown. And, um, you know, and I was in touch with Wendy, obviously, and, you know, hearing how she, you know, was still managing to meet up with her friends on Zoom and, I think you were Zooming far before I was, Wendy. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, yeah. And I think it was that idea of um, finding solace in nature. Go, you know, that's always there when we step out of our front door. Mm. Um, and that would really help Wendy. And, and it does to this day, every day, that's part of her, um, part of her enjoyment of life. 
Um, so it just felt that it was a good time to bring some of Wendy's life wisdom and life philosophy um, to other people again. You know, we told the story of her journey with, you know, diagnosis in those few years afterwards. But I think there was, you know, with Wendy's books, they're, they're not just a book about dementia. They're a book about how to live and they're a book about what's important and and it felt like she still had more to say. Yeah. It still does. Really, Anna, she had more to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's a great point as well, because I remember when I read it the first time, I, I had um, tweeted, you know, this isn't just a book for people who want to understand more about dementia. It's for people who want to understand more about people. Mm -hmm. There's such a lovely baseline of kind of humanity and care mm -hmm. and kindness. And, you know, well, that's what, that's what dementia teaches you. You know, it, it slows you down so much that you see how kindness can affect you, how a smile can affect you. Because your, your brain is so slow at connecting with things. These things aren't fleeting moments anymore. They, yeah. they last. I've forgotten where I was going on that one now. <laughs> it was a really beautiful sentiment. I, mm. I think it's something like it makes sense to me that Anna is saying that this book felt sensible during lockdown because I think mm. for many of us we were trying to slow down to reconnect mm. with those things that are important. Yeah, I think lockdown ta taught us all so much about the the need to slow down. Yeah, you know we we. I, I was as guilty as anybody when I worked as wishing for the weekend, wishing for the next holiday, wishing for tomorrow. Whereas dementia slows you right down to just this moment. Yeah. And that this moment is the only guarantee we have in life. No one knows what yeah. the next moment will hold. Exactly. It's very, very pertinent this week with what's going on in the news as well. Exactly. Yeah. Just didn't enjoy the moment that you're in and appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Wendy, I'd like to get into a little bit of some of the themes in the book, but I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just, just giving us a little short reading from it to yeah, give us yeah. a flavour of what it's like. Yeah, of course. Uh, as I said before, I'm always talking about turning negatives into positives because that's how I cope and I often speak about the gifts of dementia which put some people think well what on earth can the, can the gift be from dementia but I call them gifts because I know dementia would hate to think of giving anybody a gift so I like to talk to name these special moments a gift. Dementia can be cruel in so many ways, yet every so often it hands us a gift in a most unexpected form. It was a bright day in the garden and the sun was starting its descent, streaking long shadows of the fence across the lawn. I was pottering inside, shuffling from one room to another with a cup of tea in my hand, trying to decide where to sit. Suddenly, through the glass of the double doors, something caught my eye. It took a while for the silhouette to make a recognisable figure, but it was then that I saw the unmistakable shape of him, a man standing in the middle of my lawn my father, but then he must have been dead 20 years. Should I have been frightened to see him in all his incredible yet very ordinary detail? He was wearing his familiar baggy green cardi, his happy casual clothes that he wore to potter in his own garden shed, and on his face was the same relaxed smile. A tip of mine for visual hallucinations is to take a photograph on your phone or iPad of what you think you can see 
And if it's in the picture, it's most likely there in real life. But in that moment, I didn't want to break the spell. He stood, just looking at me, his hands hanging by his side. Even the yellow of his nicotine-stained fingers visible from this distance. His hair was styled with blue cream, as it always was, black and shiny. The last of the sun reflected back from the black quiz that never went grey. I was reminded as we stood looking back at one another of the times I would climb into his lap as a small child and he would pay me a penny for grey hair that I could find and pull from his scalp. The memory of that moment returned me to the warmth of his touch, the sweet sugary scent of his brill cream and its bright red pot. I don't know how long we stood looking at each other. It could have been minutes or hours. Dementia has a funny relationship with time. I felt not fear, but an emotional pull to stay and spend some time in the company of my dear old dad again. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm doing applause here. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage and really well read. Thank you so much for that, Wendy. Um, you know, you, you talk about the gifts that dementia gives and, and that clearly was a, a kind of a comforting moment for you, that, that hallucination. But I know that sometimes hallucinations can be more disturbing and difficult. Um, yeah. How do you cope with that? Well, I always have, it's either the 30 minute rule, in which case I, I go away and come back in 30 minutes and if the vision is still there, yeah. then I know it's probably real. Yeah. But in most cases, it usually isn't. Yeah. If I'm alert enough, then I'd take a photograph. Yeah. But in those moments of real distress, distressing hallucinations when I don't always think of my camera yeah. but I think to walk away and come back so that's that's how I cope and is there any way a lot of folks here watching today will have a loved one with dementia and mm. I, I know I've experienced um you know folks that I've been working with who are having visual hallucinations how, how can we help yeah you you can help by living in our world in that moment yeah. because we can't live in yours. T to us, whatever we're seeing is very real. And so, you know, a loved one, if we're saying, oh my goodness, look at that fire in the garden or whatever, then to us, there's a fire in the garden. Don't, don't say, no, there isn't, don't be silly because that just confuses us and yeah. makes us even more anxious. So instead, play the game of dementia and you know, say something like, oh, don't worry, I'll go and put it out. You go yeah. upstairs and have a cup of tea and I'll go put it out. Yeah. To, to, so by contradicting us, you're causing more confusion rather than helping. So it's simply living in our world because we can't live in yours. And that, that's huge. I'll, I'll, it's something that I get asked a lot, you know, what is, is the best way to help? And one of the things I love about this book is, and we've talked a little bit about already, it's your playmates and how yeah. honest they are in sharing yeah. their experiences, not just people who are living with dementia, but also their loved ones, their mm. partners, their um, children. Um, and I wonder if you and Anna could talk a little bit about, you know, why you decided to bring in all of these different experiences and different voices. What, what I mean, I could listen to just you all day, but I yeah. really loved meeting your friends as well. Why, why have we got them in this book? I thought it was so important for people to hear other people's stories and anecdotes. Yeah. Because in from the first book, 
I, I would get criticism for, oh, yeah, but that's you. You can do anything. You're resilient and all the rest of it. Yeah. And I wanted to show that other people, there's other people out there just like me, t desperately trying to live with dementia. And I, so it was so important to involve and hear their experiences. And yes, we might have similar, but some of some of my playmates have totally different experiences. And that's they're just as important. Mm. What every voice is important. So the more we had, the more real mm. it it becomes. And I'll maybe, I'll maybe ask Anna this because you don't shy away from the difficult stuff as well. Like you are one of the people I think who's most incessantly optimistic. I think you're just such a wonderful, positive person, but not, not everyone is or can be optimistic after a dementia diagnosis. And there are stories in here of people who have struggled as well. Um, yeah. as, as you have too and I know that's that's one of the criticisms that I get and I know you've got sometimes too that you know we're putting a kind of spin on you know living well with dementia maybe yeah. um, can, can we talk a wee bit about that as well yeah I don't I don't like the phrase living well with dementia yeah. it was very good back in the days when there was nothing but suffering from but I had so many emails from people and when I met people saying they can't live well, it's, it, it, it was almost as if we were setting too high a standard for them. Yeah. And so that, that's why I now say living as well as you can. Yeah. Be, because no, it doesn't sit, trip as comfortably off the tongue or fit onto powerpoints as as well as living well but it gives people a an aim in their mm -hmm. life which they can achieve rather than thinking that they can't yeah and not everybody has the same journey you know there are some people who their deterioration happens far quicker. Mm -hmm. But their, you know, their voice is just as important as mine, but it doesn't mean that mine is unrealistic. It just means we're different. Yeah, that, that's a, such a good point. Um, it's, it's just like... A, friend of mine this week after the storm on Twitter mm. they they said if we had stage one stage two cancer and we mm. looked well we weren't in a bed about to die mm. would that make our diagnosis any less real yeah yet with dementia it seems to be you know, if we're living as well as we can, yeah. and we don't have dementia. Well, trust me, we do. Yeah. Um, Anna, have you had much um, kind of comeback on this issue around, you know, representing dementia accurately? Yeah, I just wanted to mention something, actually. And Wendy and I have been at talks when I've mentioned this as well, because we've done talks together where people will say, like Wendy says, oh, it's all right for you. You know, you, you can manage to live well. My my aunt or my mom or, you know, my uh, my brother, he, he doesn't live like you do. But I always remind and, I, and in the past I've said to the audience, I just have to, you know, kind of interject here to say that Wendy after this talk will be shattered and Wendy will have a thumping headache for days after being here um, to speak to you and it does take a lot out of Wendy that people don't see and um, she but what she's done is she knows how to manage her time because she's experienced you know in doing these talks so she knows that she needs to recharge 
um, after after she's uh, done a talk, and um, she she has to have a rest or she has to just have a couple of days where she doesn't do anything. So, but people don't see that because they're just seeing the the what she's presenting, which is incredible and amazing. But I think I I said before that I describe her as a swan just gliding on the surface but I know that her feet are really paddling to yeah. enable her to look as serene as she does. I'm just laughing because yesterday I stopped and watched on the Conswater River two seagulls paddling up the river and I've never seen seagulls feet going below the surface before but they're pure going like crazy. <laughs> yeah it's actually quite funny to watch them and they just look so serene on the surface. Um, I wanted to, to go into, you mentioned right at the start, Anna, that you know you decided upon these six kind of sections in, in the book to look at, um, to give it some shape. So you look at senses, relationships, communication, environment, emotions, and attitude. And I I learned so much. Like I thought I knew quite a bit about dementia, having worked in this field for a decade. But I learned so many things and particularly in the sense section. And we are at the science festival. We are sandwiched between two events about flies. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you're big into flies, there's another event today. But I thought it'd be good to get some science into it. And um, I really learned a lot about how dementia can impact things like our hearing and our smell Ooh. that I wasn't aware of. So could you, the pair of you between us, give us give us a couple of kind of things that people might not know about senses and dementia? We'll maybe start with you, Anna, and we'll come to you in a wee second, Wendy. Well, I think um, I'm going to be speaking for Wendy here about the hearing, for example. Um, oh, Wendy, how do you say hyperacusis? Is that it? Hyperacusis. Hyperacusis, yeah. So Wendy started when she... Um, well, maybe you should explain, actually, Wendy. I feel like I'm speaking for you. Tell, explain yeah, tell, tell us about hyper, hyper Oh, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> well, that was what, my hearing was one of my first senses to be affected. And it wasn't that I was going deaf. It was certain tones of noise physically hurt my ears. And that's why, you know, in in hospital wards, in care homes, you see people with dementia flinch at loud noises. Yeah. I had a wonderful, I have a wonderful audiologist who spent the time, she gave me a two hour appointment, you know, how, how often does oh. that happen? But she, she wanted to learn how she could help people with dementia. And she took me outside of the consulting room, outside into the open, mm. to physically see what the sounds do to my ears. Mm. And she realized that she can help by, I have hearing aids, but she's programmed them to filter out that noise that physically hurts my ears. And she describes it as, People without hyperacusis, which is just sensitivity to noise, they have a gate in their ear mm. which closes so that a siren passing, you just hear a siren passing. Whereas my gate, my, my gate is permanently open. So I'm exposed to the full decibels of noise that happen. But with the hearing aids, it's as though she provided me with a, a gate again to oh. just dull out the noise that physically hurts my ears. Yeah. And it was actually a playmate, Agnes Houston, who first recognised that people with dementia, including herself, have hyper, can have hyperacusis. She went round with her daughter around the country interviewing many of us and she realised that many of us have hyperacusis. It's just that audiologists were slow to catch up in what we knew existed. Mm. But 
Yeah, so if someone is really sensitive to noise, then just consider the fact that it might be hyperacusis. And that's just the same as children with autism have, but for a different reason. I think she said also, your audiologist, that it would be so helpful if everybody, when they're diagnosed, could have yeah. a, um, a hearing consultation. Yeah. Because then you could pick up those problems. Because, for example, Wendy moved from a city to the countryside because she just found this, the sounds okay. really overwhelming. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that she said that uh, that would be really helpful. I think it's, it's just a really good example of the importance of healthcare professionals actually listening to people. Yeah. I know that we're treading a fine line where a lot of them are pushed for time and they're not being allocated enough time to spend with each person. But to be able to spend two hours with you and actually tailor with, you know, the hearing aids to your actual needs rather than assuming things. But, but what she did is simply put together all the appointments I would have needed yeah. and sorted me out in one appointment. So I wasn't, um, I would have needed two hours over loads and loads of weeks. And she realized that she could help me in one go, which is, you know, seems to me to be making the best use of time instead of all the backwards and forwards having to for her to have to then re get to know the patient again and for me to be explaining each time what the problem is instead we just did it all in one go and that saved both of us so much time it's such a practicality about mm. it sensible mm. always stick into the tight kind of protocol and things yeah uh, on to one of the other sections that you talk about which I know you love to talk about and that's the section on environment and you've talked yeah. there about kind of the environment around you when you're in an urban space can be quite overwhelming but I one of the things I love is following your daily trundles oh yeah fantastic photographer we get these great snapshots of sunrises and trees and what has the outdoors and the environment out there meant to you over the last few years? Oh, well, well it goes back to time again. You know, this slowing down of the brain means we see so much more detail because our eyes linger that much longer on objects. And through lockdown, I realised I actually had the time to realise what beautiful place I lived in because I was no longer travelling about the country every day. I was just here. And it was very difficult at the beginning of lockdown because I lost my routine like so many other people. And I had to find a new routine. And that new routine was just walking around my village umpteen times a day with my camera, just taking moments that people miss. You know, a, a robin singing in a tree. If you just walk past, you've missed that beauty. Or if you're chatting, you've missed that moment. And so I, I capture these moments in in my photographs and then those people often ask me when I'm out on my trundle oh have you taken any good photographs today and I haven't a clue until I get back home and I look at them but then I see the magic moments that I've seen along the way and it's people began at the beginning of lockdown they Many villagers didn't know I had dementia and they began to call me the camera lady because they, they used to see me walking about with the camera. So they saw my talent first and then learned I had dementia. And so 
saw dementia in a whole new light just by seeing me taking photographs. I have loved watching people respond to your photographs, posting their own pictures. And yeah, so are. lovely. Yeah, makes people just stop and look around them. Yeah, I think the theme from today has just been slowing down, which is yeah. really I needed to hear this weekend, definitely. And I'm going to bring you back in, in, in the section that where Wendy talks about communication. Um, you talk at length about kind of the words we use to describe dementia. And we've already talked a little bit, bit about, you know, how a, a phrase like living well with dementia can feel a bit kind of restrictive or not 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 kind of accurate anymore. Um, you and I actually met through a research project looking at how dementia is depicted in contemporary fiction. And so we've both thought quite a lot about how we write about how, you know, as artists, we capture dementia. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. There is a, a really wonderfully drawn character with dementia in your novel, The Imposter. But what are some guidelines or should there be guidelines for artists who are engaging with the subject of dementia? Yeah, I think it's it's what Wendy says all the time about how people have skills before dementia and they don't lose those skills overnight so you know it's a case of seeing the person first and the disease you know second or third or you know and um and so i think that we unfortunately we can be guilty as writers of using cliches as well to express something quickly. Um, but I think also we need to think about how helpful those cliches are because we're just perpetuating this myth that people with dementia, you know, need to, must become invisible once they have a diagnosis. And Wendy's a great and shining example of the fact that you don't need to become invisible. That lots of her friends as well have, um, you know, some of her um, other friends are great photographers. And is it, um, oh, is it George Wendy who works with wood as well? He does yeah. some carving, you know, so, uh, mm. you know, that attention to detail and, and that um, joy of focusing on the present moment um, means that, um, people living with dementia find other interests and other and you know so I think that that's really important to think about the skills that people have um and you can't mention you can't use the word suffer in front of Wendy because mm. she'll get <laughs> really cross about that mm. and I don't blame her really because she says mm. to people when she does talks you know do I look like I'm suffering um and I think that that's a really you know it's it's true and it might be a really direct way of putting it but you know, it's important to um, to not disable people with language. Um, and also in terms of professionals, I mean, there's a big section, like you said, in communication about the way that um, professionals talk to, um, to their patients when assessing them. And, you know, some of the, some of Wendy's playmates don't even go to their assessments anymore because they don't like the way they're spoken to and how negative that is. So, I think professionals have a lot to learn too. And, and just because they're, you know, working in the field and seeing people every day, it doesn't mean they need to stop looking at the kind of language they use or, and, or you know, stop having these expectations of what a person with dementia looks like or how they should live. Yeah, and it's like when I, went, when I broke my wrist and I went to, Sarah took me to the see the consultant and the first thing he said when we got in the room was well, well there's when, there's no need to operate because you've got dementia why do you need a left hand and that stunned me so much that I couldn't think of how to reply to him luckily Sarah was with me and she <laughs> put in the words for me until I came round and put in my words for him and he did have the grace to back down and see that I need a left hand just as much as he needs a left hand but it's that initial seeing on paper that someone has dementia and writing them off uh, it's as though 
people with dementia have moved on in how they deal with dementia, but the clinical world has stayed back in their 10 years ago time. Yeah, I just wish everybody would move at the same pace. Yeah, and, and that's not to say, I think I, I have recently realized that I'm terribly bad at saying all of our politicians in Northern Ireland are awful. And actually, oh, no, no, no. And no, I can, a lot of I can give you a, a lot of, of, in the same episode when I went into day surgery, how wonderful people were, the clinicians, because the, the main clinician said, I would never give anyone with dementia um, general anaesthetic because I know the impact it has on your brain. So I'll give you a block instead. And just as soon as I heard him say those words, I was immediately relaxed and thought, you know, here's someone that actually does get it. So, you know, you have one extreme to another. You know, I know, and I'm sure there are some clinicians who are listening today, and they're the good ones who are trying to learn. So, well done if you are listening. And it's a wee reminder we've got about 10 minutes left. So, if you have any questions, now is the time to pop them in the chat. I have two more questions for Wendy and Anna, and then I'm going to shut up as well. Um, my first question is, when do you talk? And I love it when you talk about that you wish in an ideal world, you wouldn't need to have your peer group with your playmates. People who are living with dementia would be integrated into society. I really want to see that as well. And I know we're not gonna fix it in eight minutes before the end, but have either of you got any practical things, any tips that we can do to move things a bit more towards that world where we're all integrated together? Well, it goes back again to seeing the person and not the dementia. You know, there's so many choirs for people with dementia, just those. So why can't we join an ordinary choir? I remember when I, I loved singing and when I joined a choir, they wouldn't let me hold the words because you didn't want them in view. But I said, but I'll, I'll forget them. If I just hold the words, I can sing like anyone else. Yeah. But she wouldn't allow that. So I had to leave. But if... You know, if they just make small adaptions to allow people with dementia to join any group, then we can be just as a valuable member and bring so much to the group, just as anybody else. That's a really but at the moment, people, people, my Minds and Voices is the only group where I can walk in and immediately feel relaxed, that no one will judge me, no one will criticize me, no one will question me. We're just allowed to be. And that would be so lovely if we could just be in your, in everyday group. Nana, what, what would your takeaway be that you would like to see change? So also having just a curiosity, which we have as writers about how other people live. And I think that's why this book is just not a book for people who live with dementia or care for people with dementia or have somebody in the family uh, with dementia. It is a book for everybody. And, um, and it's just having that curiosity about different people's life experience, which as a writer, as particularly a ghost writer, obviously, you know, for me, I inhabit other people's lives uh, to write their stories. So, so that I guess comes, you know, very naturally to me. But I think that all of us can learn um, something. And the other thing as well is, um, you know, like Wendy says, that she can go to her group and no one's criticizing her or has expectations. And you don't. So, 
to include somebody with dementia, you don't need to have an expectation on what they what they need to bring to the conversation or how much they're participating. Just to uh, just to you know have a space at the table for them um, and to for them to feel included um, in terms of uh, at a convers you know at a dinner table. They don't have to contribute, but they feel that they're a part of it. Um, and it's the same for when people aren't able to you know, verbalize themselves anymore. It doesn't mean that they're not going to benefit from you going to sit in beside them and just being with them or just holding their hand. All of these things are really important. And there was one study in the book about uh, people in a care home who had some uh, hand massages and the difference it made to their lives for weeks afterwards in terms of um, their engagement and, and their um you know not feeling so depressed and just to have that human touch and human contact made such a difference to people's lives so i think that it's not about people with dementia having to fit into us it's about us thinking about how we can enable them to participate and the small things imagine you go to a care home to visit your relative who's not able to talk to you anymore and instead of boring them about what you had for dinner yesterday <laughs> I remember having those conversations with my dad. Just sit there and give them um, a hand massage with some nice lavender oil because uh, olfactory stimulation is also really important. So we just have to think more creatively about how we can be inclusive. And it strikes me from what both of you have just shared there that those are things that will really help folks who have dementia but there are also things that translate to just being more inclusive in general that's it and we always say what well, if you get it right for people with dementia you get it right for so many others no i think i'm going to leave that as our last word today because it's a really positive full way to end our fantastic conversation today i could talk to the tfus for ages and i really mm. hope that we are going to get to sit down with tea and cake at some stage in the future and do this in person thank mm. you to everybody who's um, followed along today if you enjoyed our session please try me or anna or wendy down on twitter we'd love to hear from you or you can um, chat along with the N ni science festival at um, their twitter handle is at ni sci fest or hashtag nisf22 um, thank you so much to sarah who's been looking after us at the um, science festival mm -hmm. And we really hope to see you all again in the future. Thank you for a wonderful session. Oh, and the last thing to say, the most important thing, or the publisher will be on at us. Yeah. Copies of the new book are available, which we all show here. Um, what I wish people knew about dementia. Wendy's got the fancy cover one. <laughs> um, David is, has these on sale in No Alibis, or you can buy them from your favorite indie bookstore. Um, thank you so much to Wendy and Anna for graciously sharing your time with us today um, and I think it's really, because I know I'm going to need one too. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.